LeBron and Steph together. LeBron and Steph together. I thought that it was possible. And then it wasn't. Or maybe it still is. We'll talk about that. Plus, Draymond Green's got some problems with some people. That's just a touch of what we got going on today. It's Valentine's Day, though. Y'all never know what I'm up to. Stick around. This is Stephen A. Smith showing the house. Let's go. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show coming at you as I love to do several times a week over the digital airwaves of YouTube. As usual, thank you all for your support, the support that you're giving me. We've now eclipsed 558,000 subscribers. The way y'all have been acting, we will easily eclipse 560,000 subscribers today. No doubt about that. So keep the love coming. I'm going to keep on coming. Just click the bell. Uh, to be notified when you're watching the Stephen A. Smith show and to become a subscriber, and boom, there you'll have it. By the way, while you're at it, make sure you pick up a copy of my book, my best-selling book, Straight Shooter, a memoir of second chances and first takes, which, by the way, is now in paperback. So, again, thank you all for your support. Keep the love coming. I'm going to keep on coming. Let's get to some sports news because we have to do this before the great Shamar Moore comes on, before my man Rich Paul, LeBron James, Draymond Green's agent comes on the show, along with a host of other things that I'm talking about, to talk about the Los Angeles Lakers. Because if the Lakers ever wanted a temperature check on LeBron James' commitment, here was his chance. Warriors general manager Mike Dunleavy Jr. decided to lob a call in the 24 hours before last week's trading deadline and try to convince the Lakers to trade LeBron James to the Golden State Warriors to pair up with Steph Curry, reports Ramona Shelburne and Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN. Warriors owner Joe Lacob called Lakers Governor Jeannie Buss to move the process along. In the end, the answer was returned resoundingly on the eve of the trade deadline. Paul told Lakeup and Warriors GM Mike Dunleavy Jr. that James had no interest in the trade and wanted to remain a Laker. Sources said when Dunleavy reached out to Lakers GM Rob Palenka in those pre-trade deadline hours, Dunleavy had been told the same. The Lakers wanted to keep James, sources said. LeBron will likely remain in Los Angeles this summer, too, despite having a player option where he can be a free agent. Let me give you the lowdown right now. The Golden State Warriors offered Klay Thompson. They offered picks. The Los Angeles Lakers wanted Jonathan Kaminga. I'm not guessing. I'm not asking. Figure out how the hell I know. But know that I know. It's exactly what transpired. LeBron James immediately thwarted all of that because he wasn't interested in leaving Los Angeles. A lot of reports out there are saying his agent, Rich Paul, who's going to be on this show in a matter of minutes to explain in detail and give us specifics in regards to that, he'll speak for himself. But they were saying he killed the deal, according to numerous reports. I'm here to tell you he didn't have an opportunity to kill a report because LeBron James wasn't interested in departing from Los Angeles to go to San Francisco. Does he want to play with Steph Curry? Absolutely he does. Does he want to go to San Francisco to do it? Absolutely not. I fantasize and imagine, oh my God, what if LeBron James and Steph Curry were on the same team? Because I happen to believe that Steph Curry is the greatest shooter God has ever created. Ever. I've never seen a, a person that can shoot the basketball like Steph Curry. And so imagining him with LeBron James, you have to fantasize about it. But let me say a couple of things. Number one, LeBron James at 39 years of age, still a great, great player, still absolutely positively box office in every way imaginable. That LeBron James, I'm not giving up. Jonathan Kaminga. Jonathan Kaminga is 21 years of age. He's 18 years younger than LeBron James, and he's just coming into his own. I'm not losing Jonathan Kaminga. I'm not doing it. I'm holding on to him for dear life. That's number one. Number two, I think that LeBron James, even though he poo-pooed this deal, I think we have to take into consideration um, how happy he is or lack thereof in Los Angeles. Because if you're LeBron James, here's the part that I mentioned last week that I'm going to mention to everybody again. It's not just about the Los Angeles Lakers and their vulnerabilities. It's about the power that exists in the West. Denver's not going anywhere. They're the reigning defending NBA champions. The Clippers are coming. They're in your town sharing your arena, but are moving out after this year because they got their own new arena in Inglewood, California. Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, 
James Harden, Russell Westbrook and these boys, they could win it all, you know. They could win it all. And so we have to pay attention to that. We've seen Oklahoma City on a come up with Shea Gilgis Alexander scoring over 30 in 30 of his last, uh, in 39 games this season. We've seen the Minnesota Timberwolves as a top seed led by Anthony Edwards, who's a superstar blossoming before our very eyes. And they've got two seven-footers in Rudy Gobert and Carl Anthony Towns, or at least a 6'11 dude and a seven-foot dude. And the combination of those two things make it very, very tough for the Denver Nuggets to figure out how to offset them. They beat them last year, but this is a better Minnesota Timberwolves team. And I didn't even bring up Sacramento and what they have at their disposal as the top five team in the Western Conference. Where are the Lakers? They're vying for a playing spot. How about the Golden State Warriors who've been winning games lately? Steph Curry with Jonathan Kaminga, with Draymond Green's presence obviously elevating them defensively. They're putting you on notice. They're not going anywhere. There's still a team to be reckoned with. Where does that leave the Lakers? We haven't seen what we expected to see from this team that went to the Western Conference Finals last year before the Denver Nuggets swept them. And if you're LeBron James, again, it is legitimate to ask this question. How comfortable are you going to feel being in Los Angeles if you're the fair weather stepchild and the Clippers are a champion? If the Clippers win the championship this year, how easy do you believe it's going to be for LeBron James to be in a Lakers uniform with the Lakers being so-so? It's just a question. It's just a question. I'm not surprised this didn't come through. If you're Clay Thompson, pay attention because you're not having the greatest season, even though you're still better than most. I would love to see Klay Thompson in the Lakers uniform, but that's with LeBron and Anthony Davis, not without LeBron. So I'm looking at things from that standpoint, and I'm saying, wait a minute, peeps. We got to pay attention to this. LeBron James, Steph Curry, that would have been phenomenal. But I can understand why it didn't happen. I truly can. Let's move on to the next subject before I get to my, my first guest for today's show. And that would be that of Mr. Draymond Green himself, the four-time champion forward for the Golden State Warriors. If you remember, he had gotten suspended uh, for basically slapping Yusuf Nurkic across the face weeks ago. Well, anyway, that same Draymond Green has now called Yusuf Nurkic and his former teammate Kevin Durant, quote, cowardly, end quote, following contentious Warriors win over the Phoenix Suns this past weekend. Steph Curry made an incredible game winner this past Saturday as the Golden State Warriors defeated the Phoenix Suns, if y'all recall. But as usual, when these two teams meet up, the story was the feud between Draymond Green and Yusuf Nurkic. The last time they met, flagrant foul committed by Green against Nurkic led to an indefinite suspension that ultimately lasted 16 games. Nurkic said, quote, I mean, it's sad. He didn't learn anything. That's what Nurkic said on Saturday night. Just a matter of time. He's going to knock somebody else again. I take everything back, what I said. He don't deserve a chance. His antics, trying to hit people, just stuff he shouldn't do. Well, if you know anything about Draymond Green, Draymond Green's going to fire back. And that's exactly what he did on Tuesday. Naturally, he had quite a bit to say. Quote, following the game, the little guy goes in the media and he says, I take my words back, Green said. Frankly, I'd like to know why it's only a matter of time before I hit someone else, because I destroyed him. Durant told the media that he hoped Green would, quote, get the help he needs after the initial incident with Nurkic that led to his suspension. In response to that, here's what Draymond said about him. Rather than hear it from me, let's hear what Draymond Green had to say directly on his podcast. And yeah, so just to go questioning my character, I thought was whack. But like guys, guys are making a habit out of that. Um, him and Kevin questioned my character before, you know, as if you go question somebody's character about a basketball game as if this not real life, as if that don't affect people's pockets. Like I think all of it was really cowardly if you want my honest opinion. Yeah, I did what I did. I take my stuff on the chin. We've spoke about that. I still stand on that. I meant every word I said about it. But if you want to know the truth about that, I think all of us cowardly. I think, you know, you start going to question somebody's character in front of the whole world, it's whack. So I think they all whack, both of them, if you want my honest opinion. Um, but that's that. Uh, everybody was questioning what I said to KD. Um, at the end of the game. This is me. It's me. I completely agree with Draymond Green. 
Nobody's absolving him from his transgressions. He had no business hitting Nurkic like that. He clearly seemed to be a bit troubled, to say the least. But I think it's important that we understand where he was coming from. When you're thinking about Draymond Green and what he had to say, in response to Nurkic and Durant's assertions, these are contemporaries in the National Basketball Association. Rich, Rich Paul represents both of them, Nurkic and Draymond Green. And he's a friend of Kevin Durant's. And to know that, and then to hear people talking about how troubled you are, what was Draymond Green interp interpreting? What was he saying? He's saying that it could affect your wallet, and they know it could affect your wallet. Why would you say something like that with no regard to how it could personally affect me? If we respect one another, why would you do that to me? Now, in the case of Nurkic, I'm not going to go there because he was the one hit by Draymond Green. But Kevin Durant is a former teammate of Draymond Green's. Kevin Durant and Draymond Green has had their tensions throughout the years. And I thought this matter was resolved. They played with one another in the Olympic competition. They sat down with one another for Draymond Green's podcast. They talked about how the incidences that sparked their dissension, did, did, did tension with one another, uh, what role they felt management played in all of that, et cetera, et cetera. They talked about all of these things. So for Kevin Durant, who is a superstar in this league, who's a really, really good guy, highly knowledgeable, very thoughtful, very considerate, very protective of his teammates and what have you, you can look at him as, at his, as him coming to the defense of Nurkic. But what about Draymond Green and the collateral damage those words could call when you say he needs, you hope he gets the help he needs? And I'm going to be very, very clear about this because I said this earlier today on national television. When you are a black man, and people are talking about the help that you need, and they're talking about things like anger management and stuff like that. That is a stain that's hard to alleviate, that's hard to eradicate, without question. And what Draymond Green, as far as I was, I'm concerned, what he was responding towards was that kind of interpretation, knowing that that kind of interpretation was put out there for others to absorb. And he found himself offended by what they had to say to him, most of all. Kevin Durant. I'm not saying that Kevin Durant did anything malicious, malintent, ill intent rather, nothing like that. What I'm saying is his words can be interpreted in the wrong way or in a way that's very, very damaging to Draymond Green, which to me gave Draymond Green every right to clap back at him because what he's saying is you should know better. And if you don't know better, that means if you do know better, rather, that means you did it on purpose, which means you wanted to hurt me. And that's why I think you saw Draymond Green respond the way that he did. Who better to talk to than my next guest? He is the founder and the CEO of Clutch Sports, the man who represents LeBron James, who represents Draymond Green, who represents Anthony Davis and everything else going on, for crying out loud. The one and only Rich Paul, his first time on the Stephen A. Smith Show. What's up, big time? How are you, man? How's everything? Everything is great, Stephen A. Well, the first order, yeah, the first order of business is talk about how privileged you are to be on this damn show since you're always trying to manipulate my family <laughs> against me. Finally, I got you to come on the show. How does that feel, Rich Paul, to be on the show finally? You know, it, it feels great, although it's premature because I don't know how it's actually... I don't, I, I don't know what you're going to say, <laughs> so I'll, I'll say it's starting off great. But let's see how it is. Well, no, welcome to my world. Know. Welcome to my world when you're texting me before first take all the time. But let's get right to it, man. You've seen the news. Uh, the, the Golden State Warriors were interested in acquiring LeBron James. Not to say nobody is interested. Everybody is interested in acquiring LeBron James. But they actually made a push for it. What can you tell us? What level of truth there is? What level of falsehood there is to the reports that have circulated uh, via Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN and obviously piggybacked off of by Brian Wintors and others. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, look, I, you know, obviously, you know, it's true. Woj, is, Woj and Ramona is not going to report something that's false. Um, but I think it's a testament to LeBron and, and obviously, you know, also the organization of the Warriors who continue to be aggressive and want to, to compete. And so, look, you know, things like this takes place. And obviously, when you're talking about the names at that level, it's going to be, it's going to be news. But it, it it wasn't much news um, in terms of the timing and, and spent on it. And you say that because why? That there was no way in hell that LeBron James would even consider making such a move? Is that why you say that? No, he's committed to the Lakers. I mean, Jeannie has been 
an incredible partner for 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 him and us and and I think it's important for that to be understood and and, and to be respected obviously you know there's ups and downs and emotions throughout the course of a season but ultimately you know LeBron's committed to the Lakers speak to how happy LeBron James is or lack thereof when it comes to being a Los Angeles Laker at this moment in time. How happy is he to be a Los Angeles Laker at this moment? I mean, LeBron's been great. He's been he's been more than happy in terms of um, just his experience as a Los Angeles Laker. I, I think um, that's the one thing that Jeannie always was wanted to make sure that she reiterated is, is the importance of his happiness. And look, you know, I think people um, tend to place a responsibility of winning every year mm -hmm. that's not realistic for mm -hmm. nobody not for LeBron it's not realistic for um, any of the players today or any of the players in the past I mean I think people always go back to a 6-0 and finals but that's when you got there but they don't, they're not counting the years that that you fell short and so look I think it's hard to get to the mountaintop it's hard to get back to the mountaintop after being there and so for those guys who have gotten there and have achieved the winning uh, while being there, you know, the great ones, you know, they, they want that feeling over and over and over again. But it's extremely difficult. And so for me in my conversation, I can't put words in LeBron's mouth, but for mm -hmm. my conversations with him, it's been just enjoy the game, you know, enjoy the game. You have a lot less years to play than you've already played. I don't think he owes anybody anything. I don't think there's nothing else for him to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he's in a space where he has to win every year. He's already home. And so just enjoy it. You know, enjoy uh, being in the locker room with those young guys. Enjoy creating memories uh, as a Los Angeles Laker. And, you know, finish strong. However many more years he wants to play, it's totally up to him. As of today, he's definitely playing for the love of the game, and he still loves the game. He still wants to compete, and and he gets up every day wanting to be better as a ball player. And, and so I'm just appreciative of that, as you can see to, in today's game, to have somebody his age still love the game with having all the trinkets and all the money and all the success that he's had mm -hmm. and to still love the game, that's rare coming in. That's rare in year one let alone year 21. Well, I'm going to give props where props is due by saying this. I'm going to tell you what the biggest rarity is. The biggest rarity is a guy to be 39 years of age in his 21st season in the NBA looking and being as great as he has looked and continues to be. LeBron James is one of the top players on the planet right now in his 21st season, and credit deserves to be given to him in that regard. But I ask that, but I, with that in mind, I ask this question. Can, is he capable of just enjoying the young guys and having a good time without being in a position to win if the team fell off? They were in the Western Conference Finals last year, so we can't look at the Lakers and just dismiss yeah. that. But um, it's the way you sound at times, it's as if, listen, just go out there, play, have a good time because you've already done it all. And I'm like, yeah, that works if you're not as great as him. But when you are still as great as he still is, doesn't that bring a different uh, 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 momentum to the, to the equation? Yeah, I would say no. I would say, you know, as a competitor, that's easier said than done. Um, and, and coming from me, obviously, that's easier said. Than, but I'm always, you know, a lot of times when you when you represent guys, you you know, you have to um, speak with speak to them from a place of from a perspective of just having balance. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of times there's so much pressure put on all these guys, especially someone like him who. You know, despite whatever he does, it's going to always be an opinion from someone else. Right. And you can't go through life trying to prove yourself to those that's going to be opinionated for whatever reason, because you don't know where that opinion stems from. Right. right? And you don't know what's behind that opinion. And so I try to help him just stay focused on, um, you know, the, 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 the task at hand and just enjoying the game at this point. I mean, look, you're 21, man. 21, he's still competing at a high level. I mean, you know, if you wanted to, you can put him in any conversation there is to be put in. And so at that point, it's a team sport. Mm -hmm. If this was tennis or if this was golf and it was an individual sport, that's a little bit different. But, you know, you can't control everything. It's just it's just extremely difficult to do that. And at this and at this state, you know, with the rules and everything that's in place and a lot of things has changed since he's been a, since he first entered the league. 
And I think he's overachieved. You know, the expectation on him coming in That's fair. was was tremendous. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a ton of doubt. There was a there was there was people that definitely didn't want to see him succeed for whatever reason they had right. um, or whatnot. And I think he he overachieved. And so to come in as highly touted as he was and as scrutinized as he was and with all these people just waiting for him to mm -hmm. fail and to overachieve and to still be there now today, relevant, and to have um, teams seeking you out to play with their younger stars. I mean, look, it's a basketball fantasy, right, playing with – such great players and, and when you mention a guy like Steph Curry yep. from a basketball perspective I think people rise from the dead to want to play with Steph absolutely Curry, you know because he's one of the greatest players to ever not shooters he's one of the greatest players to ever touch a basketball right um, and they were born in the same hospital which is a fun fact <laughs> but the, but but the reality of it is you know when you are a professional athlete and you have a commitment and you have a partnership and you've been treated um, with nothing but grace and respect and uh, from a partnerial perspective, it's important for you to honor that. It's important for you to be um, committed to that. And and for a guy at the level of a LeBron James, the reason why I wanted to step out and say what I said, and you're right, I heard you today, I'm going to do always do what's best for the client and what's asked of the client, but there's no reason for you to have representation if you're not going to... Well necessarily value their advice that's where i was going you know and and so for me i sit in a, i sit in a, in a very um interesting seat right because the hardest part of my job is to sometimes you have to be the other voice right um and it wasn't that in this case because right. it was it was shot down right away but right. i've been in situations that you know you may agree to disagree on things but ultimately the perspective that I that I like to come from always gives a balance, and so, um, you know, it's th this stuff is fun. Though I, I yeah. actually enjoy it, and, and to wake up and to hear all the news, and I, and I knew it was coming, but it's just a it's just a testament to to his hard work. In this case, it's mm -hmm. just a testament to his hard work. Well, a couple of things. Number one, you alluded to Steph Curry and LeBron James being born in the same hospital. That's Summa uh, Health Systems in Akron, Ohio. They were both born. Uh, Steph Curry and LeBron James were both born there. That's number one. Number two, I'm glad you brought up yourself because my question to you, and I'm getting ready to get into a deeper discussion about you and Clutch Sports in just a second. I wanted to ask you if LeBron James had even hesitated. What specifically, I know what your position is, but explain to our audience what you would have said in an effort to basically say to him, I don't know if this is the right thing to, for you to do. Think about leaving the Lakers to go to the Golden State Warriors. What would you have said to him? Yeah, I would say, what's, what, you know, what's, where's the win? You know, where's the win? If, if, if just taking the Warriors out, just any team okay. at this point in your career, where's the win? Because if you go somewhere and you fall short, then I can count 50 losses. Yeah. So what's the value in that, right? You know, oftentimes, you know, people get caught up into making impulsive decisions. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of friends that's not here no more today because they made impulsive decisions. Right. Right. Same here. And so I think oftentimes we spend a lot of time, again, trying to validate the opinions of people that aren't even validated themselves. And so for me, just standing in the moment and again, understanding uh, that the grass ain't always greener. We understand that. Mm -hmm. And he's already home. What else, what else, if, if you go somewhere and you win another championship. That's where I was going. Okay, okay. What, 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 what in his life is gonna change? There's still gonna be barbershop conversations about who somebody think is the GOAT and why they think they're the GOAT and why they don't think he's the GOAT and so on and so forth, there's still going to be conversations about why he belongs on the Mount Rushmore or the Lakers or don't belong on the Mount Rushmore. There's going to be so many different conversations. You can slice it or you can skin it or you can twist the narrative however you want to twist it. You know, I see a lot of guys on these podcasts. And it's too many podcasts, by the way. But I see 70, a lot of guys. 70,000, Rich. 70,000 podcasts. 70,000. Yeah. Yeah, that's too many. Yes. Um, and I and and I and I see a lot of guys on these networks, and you know, and look, part of it is their job, so I get it. But 
if you're having a real conversation, yeah. there's nothing else for LeBron James to do in the in the world of basketball. Not nothing. You want to talk about not catching oh, well, Kobe, not catching MJ. Just asking. Catching him at what? Championships. Number of titles. That's all. Number of titles. That's all. Five and six. No, okay. no, it's not because just like you know, again, you talked about it today. I think you guys talked about it. Somebody was talking about maybe it's on the on the on another show I was watching, but right. they talked about Apple being worth two point nine trillion yep. and Microsoft being worth three trillion. Yeah. You That's know, true. there's 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 if LeBron, Mike, and Kobe was in a room together, mm -hmm. they all belong. True. They all belong. There's no room of basketball that LeBron's going to get to that door Rich Paul, and be denied on the list. That, that Not is one. the most – I've known you for years. That is the absolute most accurate thing you have ever stated, that LeBron, Kobe, MJ, they belong in the same room. I mean, this is the first time you've said something that I can't even debate. I, I don't even have a chance of debating you. That You're absolutely right. Let me get to you for a quick second talking about you because you've got an extensive client list. You've got Anthony Davis. You've got Tyrese Maxey. You've got Draymond Green, who we'll get into in a couple of minutes or so before I let you get on out of here, but you've done a phenomenal job being the leader of Clutch Sports, the, the, the founder and the CEO. You've got NFL clients right now. As you sit back and reflect and remember, you know, just thinking about all the things that you've accomplished in your career as an agent in this business, how do you sit right now? I'm talking about in yourself, thinking about you and what you've accomplished. By the way, you're a best-selling author, so let's not forget about that either because you deserve a lot of credit for that. I would know something about that, by the way. But your thoughts about where you are right now? You know, look, I'm in a great place. And honestly, Stephen, I, I think back on all this stuff, and, you know, I'm blessed, man. I, I, I really am. You know, I come from a world in which, you know, guys don't make it to this to this place. And when I say that, it's, it's not based upon finance. You know, everybody bases things upon money. And I think that that's been an issue around our league. People look at money as having success and people look at money as being a decision maker, so on and so forth. And that's not the case for me. Um, I think just continue to be a great example. I've achieved things despite um, for so many years and, and I don't do it by myself. You know, I look around and having the ability to affect people's lives by hiring them and positioning, you know, staying late in the office the other night, talking to some of the young people in the office just about life and things like that. I'm extremely blessed, which is why when people look at me and they say, well, you know, you don't seem to get rattled about anything if you were to no longer work with a top client or if you didn't get this guy coming in the draft and so on and so forth. And I say no, because at the end of the day, uh, I built and we built a tremendous business. I've continued to grow my portfolio and things that I want to do and want to accomplish as a, as an executive and a creator. Uh, I think there's enough room for everybody to be successful. And I think it's, it's, um, I think, you know, we're now in a place in which, you know, for me, I've just always been about the respect and I, and I, and I appreciate the guys that came before me, you know, the Bill Strickland's, the Doc Tucker's, you know, the Eugene Parker's, um, you know, that people had it, had it rough, mm -hmm. you know, and I, and I came into a place where I hit it at a time where the business of basketball was booming. Mm. And I had a tremendous, you know, 10 years, hit right. it, boom, 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 boom. And then, you know, disrupting the industry where, you're leading with education and not a checkbook, mm. right? Because we know most people in my position, you know, they're glorified ego strokers. Right. They have a master in ego stroking. And that's, and again, as an agent, you have to have some of that in you. But my positioning was that can't be the end all be all. Mm. And so I know when I'm having a conversation amongst parents or amongst talent, if they don't necessarily value the conversation I'm having, then I know our relationship is probably not going to work because I'm coming at it from a totally different perspective. And I refuse to be put in a box. I won't be put in a box. I'm not just an, an agent. And at the end of the day, um, you know, I'll continue to just like you, you know, me and you have side conversations about several things. Yeah. You learn your business from a different perspective now and you have a different perspective on it and you work to position yourself to where 
you can be a decision maker and you can do different things based upon what you earn. I feel the same way. And so as I'm in sports today and, and you know, we just got into baseball and we'll get into another sport and, we, and people don't know, but we do sponsorships and, and, and we do a lot of consultant work for different brands. We built a really great company and I have a great partner in UTA, uh, which I'm on the board and, and co-head of sports there. And so all that's great. I never, I never even thought I would be in that position, but I also never was complacent with any so-called is, win. Is there a defining moment where you felt this is what put me here? This Is there one thing that you can point to over the course of your career, which is now illustrious, nobody could deny that, that you can definitively say this moment right here was a defining moment for me in this round? Yeah. I mean, actually, you know, on our group chat, well, one of many group chats I'm on, but uh, one of our group chats, this question was just asked to me. Okay. And I named about 15 things okay. just not understanding. But, mm -hmm. yes, to answer your question, there were several. And this is for the young people out there. Listen, one of the first things I ever did was make a sacrifice, right? And you know it. When LeBron first went to Miami, I went, but I didn't go. Mm -hmm. I was focused on, you know, I was recruiting Tristan back in, the, in that time. I was recruiting Johnny Flynn back in, I mean, before yep. that. But I was recruiting Tristan, I was recruiting Corey, Corey Joseph, and and Eric Bledsoe, right? And so what that showed was that I was serious and I was focused and I wasn't dependent of anybody for that matter, right? And so because of that, that led to the next thing, me advising LeBron to go back to Cleveland. Well, he took me serious based upon me having a real knowledge and understanding of what was going on and why. And then that led to the next thing, which was, um, you know, Eric Bledsoe's contract. And then that led to getting a guy like Contavious Caldwell Pope. And then that led to John Wall, who was a former number one pick, switching, which was a big deal. And that led to, you know, having Ben Simmons as the number one pick and then getting Anthony Davis. And then, you know, Darius Garland, who had a meniscus tear, still going top five. And then, you know, it's just so many different things within that, you know, um, you know, again, a guy like Chris Livingston being drafted at 58 when there was a reporter for the a Kentucky reporter that said this kid would not get drafted in four drafts when he decided to leave because they were trying to discourage him to come back to school and for him to have guaranteed money and just get a head start in life. See, my thing is helping all these young men understand the importance of having a starting point of direction in life. Basketball comes second. Basketball is a vehicle, right? But it's not the end all be all. And so you're going to stop playing. But what have you learned? If you're talking on the phone to your guy and he's just telling you everything you want to hear, you hang up that phone. Shit, you could have been talking to anybody. You could have been, you might as well, you know, call the, uh, the, 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 uh, the telethon, you know? Um, and so at the end of the day, I just come at it from a different perspective. Right. And you and I, have several conversations. I know people see you on TV ranting and raving, yes. that's going crazy at me, but that's part of it. But we also have important conversations no as doubt. well offline. And so I'm just, a, today I'm just in the, I'm in a great space, man. I'm just appreciative, Stephen A. Um, you know, I don't do this stuff alone. I've had a lot of help along the way. I've had a lot of people supporting me along the way. And I still have that. And, mm. you know, I really feel like, you know, when, when, when I succeed or when I do something well, it's us doing something well. When I talk about us, I'm talking about the young generation. I'm talking about the youth because I'm an example of, despite what anybody say you can or can't do or any credentials mm -hmm. you may lack, you can mm -hmm. still be somebody and position yourself. And so I really, I really, you know, I hold that in a special place. Well, I respect the hell out of you. I respect what you've accomplished and I love our relationship and how we communicate even when you're getting on my damn nerves because you're kind of you're trying to control the rundown of my shows and all of that stuff. But before I let you get on out of here, man, I, I got to transition. Two more things. Number one, Draymond Green, another one of yep. your clients, a four-time mm -hmm. champion. He's gone through a lot. We all know this. Uh, we were speaking about it. I was speaking about it earlier today. I'm speaking about it now because he called out Kevin Durant and Yusuf Nurkic, calling them cowardly. Um, 
my position was I understood exactly where he was coming from because when it came specifically to Kevin Durant, that's his former teammate. And as black men, when you hear, you know, you need help, you hope they get the help that they need and stuff like that. Yeah, other people could say that. I could say that in my position. The media can say that. Even a team you play for can say that because obviously you getting suspended sort of derailed them to some degree. And we see the impact that he has since he's been back. But for a former teammate to take that position, somebody that you once had beef with, but ultimately y'all resolve matters and what have you, I understood exactly where Draymond Green was coming from. That's my position, however. What is yours? Yeah, you know, look, I, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, when men have a discrepancy, you know, you try to let men work it out. You know, that's that's the word I come from, Right. right. Um, but in my position as Draymond Green's representation, you know, we had the conversations, but, um, and I think as you can see, when, since he's been back, I think he's had no technical fouls. Yeah, one. He had yeah, no, one. Oh, yeah, one. Okay, yeah, maybe yeah. one. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's fresh. Yeah. So, but I, he and I talked about just being a champion of change, you know, but I don't want to take, I don't want to take away that spark of, 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 the reason people don't understand one thing about Draymond. Draymond, if you look at the the just the numbers, they don't say four time champion, uh, defensive player of the year, a all star. They don't say that coming out of Michigan State. You know what they said? Mm. They said overseas player, and that's no uh, that's no just disrespect to people playing overseas. But no one thought he would be able to play in the NBA at the level he's played at and achieved the things he's achieved. The reason why he has been able to is because of that, what's inside of him, that fire that's inside of him. And obviously he's a, he's a very intelligent ball player. I know all these guys very well. I represent Yusuf Nurkic as well. Right. And Kevin Durant is a friend of mine. And I, the only thing I would love is if they did it, you know, properly um, off, 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 offline. I, I'm not really in a, uh, emoji, you know, yeah. online Instagram mm. type of person. That's yeah. not that's not what I'm 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 rolling with there. So, mm. but again, it's it's competitive. It's part of the, the the business. It's part of the game. And as long as it, they keep it about the game and don't take it to a personal side of things, then um, it is what it is. I can't tell a person how to feel, but but also I think that. At, when two men have an issue, they should talk it out. And I, when I say talk it out, I really mean talk it out. Because right. as you can see, in our communities today, um, there's far less talking and, and, and far more doing behind things that probably isn't worth doing. Absolutely. So, um, I think it's important for us to, people in the position that we are, to stress communication. Mm -hmm. I think communication is key. Last question for you on a different note, man. It is Valentine's Day. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I mean, yeah. you know, I, I'm just wondering, you know, uh, is there anybody? I want to tell your business. I want to tell your business. I know everybody want to report the business. I want to tell your business. Is there somebody out there, to, a special Valentine that you would like to wish a lovely and happy Valentine's Day to, sir? <laughs> I mean, I'm just asking. Yeah. I'm just asking. Yeah, I would, I would really love to wish my daughter a, a, a happy Valentine's Day. Okay. All right. Um, All right. You know, she's... Uh, She's an incredible young lady that I'm extremely proud of, and so okay. I definitely want to wish her happy birthday. What's her name? Day. What's her name again? What's her name? What's your daughter's name? Rihanna. Okay. Her daughter's name is Rihanna. Rihanna. Yeah. So you want to wish her? Is... different than Rihanna. She was born before Rihanna. Okay. Is there anybody else that you want to wish a happy Valentine's Day to? I'm just checking. <laughs> I'm just checking. You know, we're going to have a great Valentine's Day. Um, Adele and I are going to have a great Valentine's Day. All right. Today. Um, yeah, she's special to me, and she knows that, and so... We're gonna have a great Valentine's Day today. I'm looking forward to it. Now you you yeah. you you know you can't be cheap, right? You know, I mean, because I know how frugal you could be, and you know, no, 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 you no, know no. you could be frugal. No, no. Listen, you know that. First of all, Stephen A. If anybody knows me, they know I'm not cheap. Okay, frugal, frugal. Okay. Well, yeah. I, shit, I gotta be frugal. Shit, I gotta save for a rainy day. I understand. I gotta be frugal. Uh, excuse me. You just said Rich Paul 
founder and CEO of Clutch Sports, one of the top yeah. agencies. Now, not only yeah. you represent NBA and NFL players, but you're going to be getting in the, in the baseball as well. I'm in okay, baseball, so we yeah, know how much money's in baseball. And then on top of it all, the, the, the wonderful, wonderful Adele herself, you just mentioned, I didn't mention her, you mentioned her. I mean, I yeah. don't think we associate rainy days when it comes to her. I mean, you're you going to be all well, right. She said, well, well, the difference is she, she, she set fire to the rain, but I know That's what right. it's like to, 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 to sit in it, you All know? Right. And so for me, right. I, uh, you know, I just always come from a place of, of, of balance, man, okay. you know, for real, I, you know, but I'm, I'm not, I have taste and I have class. And you know, I don't I, do anything. I, I'm just talking about tonight. I'm just talking about tonight. I mean, don't, don't be frugal. You, you, it's 365 no, think, days in a year. Think, Three, look, so one day you could, you could come out of pocket and, you know, just splurge. Well, when you when you date a guy like me, every day is Valentine's Day, Steve. Yeah, that's a slick. I knew that. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. Appreciate you, Rich Paul, man. Thanks a lot, man. Happy Valentine's Day to the wonderful, marvelous Adele. She's off the chain. I'm a huge fan. Wish her nothing but the best. Thank you for coming on the show today, taking time out of your busy schedule, bro. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, man. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank All right, you. man. Take care. The one and only Rich Paul, agent extraordinaire, founder and CEO for Clutch Sports, the agent for LeBron James himself and Draymond Green right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Got lots more to get into right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show as we continue because Valentine's Day is here. There's a bunch of things to get into, and we most certainly will. So stick around. You're watching the Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airwaves of YouTube. Back with more, much more in a minute. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. You know what time it is, right? It's time for Stephen A.'s Weekly Picks. Now, look, I've teamed up with Prize Picks to bring you my favorite sports picks each and every single week. Not sure if y'all know this, but Prize Picks is a skill-based, real-money daily fantasy sports game where you select two or more players and predict if they will have more or less of their game stats. But the part that I really, really love, y'all... You can pick and choose from all the sports that you love to watch, basketball, soccer, even MMA, okay? And if you go to prizepicks.com right now and use promo code SAS, you'll receive a 100% deposit bonus up to $100. You heard me right now. Go to prizepicks.com, type in my initials SAS to get a first-time deposit match up to $100. Today, however... I ain't talking about sports. And do you know why that is? Do you know why that is, y'all? I'm going to tell you why that is, y'all. I'm going to tell y'all why that is. Because it's Valentine's Day. That's why. February 14th, to be exact. You know what that means, okay? Again, Valentine's Day. A day for the ladies. A day for love, okay? So I've decided to pick a few ifs in this equation, okay? Let's go to item number one, please. More or less... There are one and a half dates before the first kiss. I'm going to have to say more, at least a second date. Now, Stevie A ain't going to try to be phony right now. He ain't going to try to act like I'd ever kissed on the first date, because that would be a lie. There are a few times in my life that I've gotten a kiss on the first date, and I'll even confess this much. I was actually looking for more than the kiss, okay? I was looking for more. I didn't say I got more, but my point to you is, I'm not going to be phony and act like there's no kissing on the first date. But there are, those are the exception. That shouldn't be the rule. The rule should be at least a couple of dates. I mean, at least. You know what I'm You want somebody else's mouth touching yours? You got to be thoroughly, thoroughly, thoroughly turned on. And even then, you got to look at her. And if you're a young lady out there, you got to ask yourself, what would this dude think of me if I just gave him a kiss or dare I say even more on the first date? That's not good. You understand? You want to make sure you show class, you show decorum, you show self-respect. All of those things come into play. So I would say the answer to this question is more. When folks work for it, they value it more. The easier it is to get, easy is not what turns people on. You feel me? Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here with the digital airwaves of YouTube. It is my honor and privilege to be standing here right now getting ready to talk to my next guest. I love the photo he's got behind him. What I don't 
like is that hat that he's got on. But I'm a, I'm a Yankees fan. I don't know what that's about. But I'm talking about one of the great actors in the business, one of the great people in this business, the one and only Shamar Moore. What's up, big time? How are you, man? What's How's good? What's been? good? Hey, before we started, I said, I don't want no smoke. I don't want no smoke. <laughs> and now you're going after my hat. Come on now. I'm a Yankee hey, fan. I'm a Yankee fan. I, what can I, I, I say? You, I mean, hey, hey, life's about choices, baby. Right. Life's about choices. <laughs> now, what, now, what is this? What is this? I hear, did I hear this correctly? That you once you aspired to be a baseball player before you got into acting? Is that true? I, I did. I did. My dream was to play in Fenway Park. But see, I'm half black, half white. So, okay. So the black side of me is from Oakland. I'm from the Bay, 98th Avenue behind the Coliseum. So right. my sports is all over the place. Mm. I'm a Warriors dude, not just because of Splash Brothers. Back when Bernard King, Lloyd B. Free, uh, I'm telling you. So I'm I'm Warriors, Raiders, Niners, and then I'm Boston Red Sox. Mm. And so I went to college on a scholarship, played at Santa Clara University. I was a pitcher and an outfielder. Wow. Got looked at, got looked at by the Boston Red Sox and the Baltimore Orioles. So my dream was to play in Fenway Park, and and I was good, man. I was good. I was throwing about 93. Wow. I was out there. Had, I got I got a little something in uh, here. Okay, something, okay, something, okay. You know. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you, you know, to make it to the top, to make it up there with the big boys. It ain't no joke. And, and I didn't quite make it. But uh, then I found this thing called Hollywood. So the rest is here. Well, listen, the one thing we know for sure without seeing any clips from you, you damn sure knew how to throw a pitch better than me. I'll give you that because I don't know if you know if you don't know, just go to watch me throwing out the first pitch at Yankee Stadium. It was embarrassing. I choked. I choked, Shamar. I just flat out <laughs> choked. I just did. Hey, I'm with you. Hey, I threw, I threw out the pitch in 07. I got a picture of it up here in, in my office. Right. I threw out the pitch in Fenway Park, so I never made it to the Red Sox, but I got to throw out the first pitch in front of my favorite uncle, Uncle Stephen Wilson, wow. out there in Boston. And so I'm warming up on the sideline with the ball girl, and they're, paying, they're playing against Tampa Bay. And, uh, and I'm warming up. And so I go to my uncle, and all I want him to say is, go get him. Good luck. And he looks at me, and he goes, don't you freaking bounce it. <laughs> and so I, I went out there and I threw it about 82 miles an hour. I don't think it was a strike, but I didn't bounce it. But then fast forward about two years later, I went to Dodger Stadium and I bounced that. Pass. Oh, that hurt. To, that <laughs> hurt, didn't it? In front of the crowd and the audience. Oh, it yeah. did hurt. Oh, yeah. I said, oh, yeah. damn, I messed up. I messed up big time. But listen, first of all, congratulations. This Friday, February 16th, season seven for SWAT. Yes, sir. I'm a fan yes, of the sir. show. I'm a, I'm a fan of Hondo Harrelson. I'm a fan of all the things that you've been doing. How much are you loving doing this show and what's so special about it for you? Man, I'm a, I'm a little kid. It's, it's like playing cops and cops and robbers in the backyard. I get to I get to play a superhero, a super cop, a superhero without wearing the tights because I ain't wearing no damn tights. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now nah, what we've done with this show, it's like watching an action movie, but made for TV. Uh, you know, it's like Fast and the Furious, you know, Die Hard. I mean, we got motorcycle chases, helicopter stunts. We're repelling off of buildings, uh, car chases, hand to hand combat. So. You know, to play badass Daniel Hondo Harrelson, it's a good, it's a good time. But we also, you know, we got a lot of humanity in the show. But like when you hear that theme song, na na na, yeah, na na, yeah, you know what time it is. So, so I just shout out to I call them the homies, the fans, and the baby girls. So to all the support we've been getting all around the world. Look, we're top fifteen on Netflix. We got Howard Stern talking about us. We got you talking about That's us. Right. You know what I mean? So, so I pinch myself. That's a dream come true. I'm wondering, looking at Hollywood today and looking at the kind of content, particularly in the age of reality TV and stuff like that, which, right. by the way, listen, no, 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 no shade on any of those folks, but real actors, real actresses, I lean towards them and give them that love and support all day, every day. And I guess what I'm asking is, as you look at the content that's being put out there in the stratosphere in this day and age, is there an element about SWAT that you think really, really contributes and assists to its longevity that people might be missing? Well, you know, as far as network TV goes, and I'm, and I'm biased, there's no such thing as the best, the best show on TV. But I will, I will say proudly that I think we are a very unique show. Um, again, we got Howard Stern talking. We got you talking. Uh, we got families watching this show. You know, Netflix helped us out tough. I mean, right. within two weeks, we were number 11, number seven, number four. Then we hit number one. And what we hear the most, there's two things. There's two things I'm proud of. What we hear the most is, is families sit down and watch our show together. Okay. You know what I mean? And, and, and so because it's fun for everybody, you get that crazy action. But then, you know, but then we also, 
We also talk about current topics. Uh, excuse me, my don't worry about get this late. We good. We always talk about current topics. I mean, we've done episodes about school shootings, which is relevant and important. Um, we've done suicide by cop. We talked about human trafficking. We talked about Black Lives Matter, and uh, <clears throat> so we, we have a bunch of fun. We don't preach to you. We don't talk about politics. We don't talk about religion. So we, we give you we give you a good time, but we also give you topics and we give you a sense of heart camaraderie and humanity uh, how tough is it and it's challenging and i'm asking this for not not just for you but for personal reasons in terms of somebody that's hosting a, a show and what have you and does television every every weekday etc cetera, etc cetera. when you think about the linear audience you hear so much about the transition to the digital stratosphere yes this show is on cbs but it's also going to be on paramount plus you have different audiences do you how do you figure out what kind of subject matter that audience is going to gravitate to, particularly when the audience might be different or linear compared to digital, even though you're obviously serving both? Well, at network television, just by rule, because you're, you're reaching such a large demographic of people, and then also, you know, we're, we're also trending and transitioning, uh, resonating in right. other countries. So it, it has to apply, it, ha it, it has to be felt and understood by a mass audience. So you have to be a little more general and, and you got to be a little safer. You got to mm -hmm. then, then stream to Netflix, Amazon, Hulu. Um, now, let me tell you, if we, if we were to go to Netflix, right. oh, SWAT would be on a whole nother level. That's right. It'd be, That's it, right. It'd be, on a whole nother, <laughs> it'd be on a whole nother level. But um, so, you know, there, you got big time movie stars. They're not doing movies anymore. They're doing streaming. They're mm. doing streaming because that's where the work is. That's where the story is, the content. And, uh, you know, and then that might be the next chapter for me. But I, I ain't done with SWAT. But we reach we reach a mass, mass audience. And and so we have to keep it. We have to keep it a little safe. But we can still we, we still get a little edge and have a good time. Do you like having an edge? I'm talking to not only Shamar Moore, but the man that played Malcolm on Young and the Restless for about t nine to ten years or what have you. You understand what I'm saying? I know you were a bad boy, but look at you, damn it. Most men shouldn't want to be in your presence because you make all of us look ugly for crying out loud. So obviously <laughs> you had everybody just loving you and the whole bit. I guess I'm wondering, I mean, how much, how enjoyable is it for you to play this role, especially with the action, compared to when you were doing soaps. Let, let me say this first. Now, you, you you out there trying to be a little soap star, too. All right? <laughs> you know, over there in General Hospital, Maurice Bernard, <laughs> who plays Sonny. The, the only thing you miss it, if you really want to go big, because I you got to sell out. Right. I did it. You got to take that shirt off and put some baby oil on for the lady. You got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't ready for that, Shamal. I ain't ready for that. Listen, man, I lost. I got, I reduced my body fat from like 29. I was bad. Skinny fat. There's, 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 there's nothing worse than that. I was at 29.6% body fat. I'm now down to 10 and a half. I could actually okay. take, but I, I want to put on like a solid 10 pounds with no belly before I take my shirt off. And then you're going to have a Stephen A. Stephen A. Calendar out there. <laughs> oh, I'm going to holler at you. I'm going to holler at you, Shamar. I'm going to be like, yo, Shamar, man, I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready, man. I think I'm ready. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to reach out and say, I think I'm ready to do this. I think I'm ready to do this. They bring a sexy back. <laughs> Stephen A. <laughs> hey, but to, to, answer, to answer your question, um, my, my, my career has been a journey, you know, and I started this in 1994. And I pinched myself. 30 years in this game, man. I'm still standing doing my thing. So blessed and so grateful. Um, I've been playing heroes and I've been playing a cop for a while. And, and again, I'm not quite done with SWAT, but one day, one day this chapter will end and I'll bow out gracefully and say, thank mm -hmm. you. And then I'm going to go kick down another door. Right. But that Shamar Moore, I'm excited about because I'm going to let the gray show. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to do, I'm, it's going to get a little edgier. I might even try to be silly out there, but I just, you know, I, I want to get out there uh, and really show people some different levels. So, and, and I think I think that's going to be in the streaming world. They said the first episode for season seven coming up this Friday, by the way, February 6th. Everybody yes, check it out right now. CBS and Paramount Plus. The one and only Shamar Moore right here with me. They're talking about that first episode as a two parter. And it was in Mexico yeah. City. Is that true? Yeah, Mexico City. What was City. that like? Yeah, yeah. We, it, man, it's crazy. Like, you know, again, this show in seven seasons, we've been traveling the world. We've been, we've been in Japan. We've been in Mexico three times. We went to Thailand. I mean, to, to live my dream and play super cop Daniel Hondo Harrelson and do it in other countries, I mean, that, that's, that's big. That's big. But, yeah, season seven, we come out the gate strong. And, and you know, they say this is our last season. They say it is. And, and again, if it is, all I can do is say thank you. Um, but 
I can tell you, as a show, as a group, there's 300 of us making this show. Um, we're trying our hardest, you know, to, to go out blazing. But when we get to the end, it's either going to be thank you and we walk up into the sunset or everybody's going to scream and yell, scream and yell and say, what the hell are you doing? This show don't need to go nowhere. But yeah, we, we come into Mexico City. I mean, I come out the gate crazy chasing. They got me running around the streets of Mexico City chasing right. the bad guys. Um, it's it's a thrill ride and it don't slow down. It and, don't slow down. And so how you don't want to miss it. And, and how would you feel about that? Because you obviously have you, you you're a visionary. You've got a lot of dreams, a lot of aspirations. You've shown no inability to accomplish what you set out to accomplish. I'm wondering how much do you want a season beyond season seven, or do you want to venture into new things, or do you want to do this show for years to come? We got we got canceled about nine months ago. We got ish. We got candles canceled on a Friday and it was gotten, like getting slapped in the mouth because we didn't see it coming. Right. And I sat with myself that night. It was a Friday night around six o'clock. This, the, you know, the, the announcement came out that no more SWAT. And I and, and people with my friends and my girl say, how you feel? And I said, well, I'm a little pissed off. Uh, I'm shocked. I'm at a loss. I don't understand. I'm confused. And so then I put out a, and I sat with myself and I, I said, you know what? I got something to say. But, and, and so I made a video. It was about seven minutes long. And before, before I push send, I'm not, this is no, no lie. I watched it about 12 times, mm. literally 12 times. 12 mm. times seven, and my publicist just told me because I'm terrible at math. He said, that's 84 minutes. Yeah. And, and I watched it 12 times because I was like, is this the right thing? Is this a good look? Uh, I don't want to come off arrogant. I don't want to come off bitter. I don't want to make it about myself. And it truly wasn't about myself because I'll be all right. You know, if the next chapter is out there. If it's now, I'm going to go get it. Um, but am I am I ready for it now? I'm ready for it, but I don't think we're done with SWAT. And so I pushed send on that bad boy, and I'm not going to take responsibility for saving the show, but I think I pushed some buttons and I made some people think. I got the fans to pay attention. A lot of media outlets picked it up just to say, okay, let's really think about this. The numbers are good. The numbers are good. It's trending. It's trending. Why are we doing this? And then 72 hours later, with the powerful people that make things happen talked about it, and they said, you know what? We're mm -hmm. at least going to give them an opportunity to bow out gracefully. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ain't done. I, we having too much fun. And, and you know, net, we, we strong on Netflix. You know, you and Howard Stern talking about it. Charles Barkley loves the show. You know I mean? The world loves this show. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'll do this. I mean, I make jokes all the time. As long as my knees hold up. I, I, ain't, I ain't done chasing Well, I'm gonna, let, 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 let's go there before I let you get on out of here. You brought up your knees. I didn't bring up your knees. You brought up your knees, okay? Uh, uh, you know, young and the restless, you know, your, your knees, you, you are all right. You're going to be okay. It doesn't require that much in soaps. I would know this. Right. But right. SWAT, it seems like it's significantly more physically demanding, wouldn't you say? Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. You got it. Look, I've been in the gym my whole life, you know what I mean? I'm vain, and we all vain, so I, you know, I get in there. I want, I want the baby girls, I want the ladies to like what they see, but all jokes aside, we, we want to pay homage to the, to the real-life men and women of law enforcement that do this. When we started this show right. seven years ago, we got trained by real-life LAPD SWAT, San Diego PD SWAT, and SEAL Team 6. These are wow. real men and women of law enforcement. They run around there with real bullets, trying to save, trying to save the day and protect people. They leave their homes and they don't know if they're coming home to their family. Now we know that we're actors just playing pretend, but we want to bring some authenticity to the show and, be, and play, pay homage to these men and women. So we're a fun show, but we, we really try to stay and keep it true uh, to what's really happening out there in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, you got to, and, and those men and women, they're put together. They yeah. gotta be to be able to do what they do. They're put together physically mm -hmm. and they're put together here, you know, mentally strong. And so we try to portray that. So, you know, I stay, I stay in the gym because you know, I want to look the part, be the part. But yeah, I'm 50, I'm be 54 in, right. in April, April right. 20th. Right. But uh, you know, I stay in the gym, I get mm -hmm. the deep tissue massages, I sit in my cold plunge in my sauna. You do the I, cold I do. plunge! You do the oh, cold yeah. plunge? Hey man, oh, I've been to. doing the cold plunge. I've been doing oh, yeah. the cold plunge every morning. No, that's magic, man. That's magic. That's that's recovery. Come on, LeBron and all them, all them pro athletes. That's what they do, and right. uh, it just it helps you recovery. So, right. but hey, don't get it twisted. Uh, season season one, I was forty eight years old. Okay. Season one, and a twenty eight year old cameraman. His name is Tim Dolan. If he sees this, he's gonna lose his mind. His name is Tim Dolan. He was talking mess. He was talking mess. He's like, I see you running around here being Hondo, or you think you athletic. He's like, I can beat you in a race. I can beat you in a race. Really? I was like, Let me tell you something. I said, I'm from East Oakland. 
You know what that means? <laughs> that means I have a big ass ego, okay, mm -hmm. and a whole lot of pride. And so I got out there and I put on a onesie tights. It was the most ridiculous thing you ever. And I cut wow. two holes in, like Flash. Okay. And I put, I cut two holes in the, in the thing just so I could see, <laughs> and a hole in my mouth. And I, I, put, I got up there and I whooped his little tail. And and <laughs> and, I, and I was told, I was told, I ran a, a, a four seven. That's what I was okay. told at forty eight years old. So my my best, my best in high school and college was a four five five. Okay. So I wasn't the fastest. So see, I, I can still I can still run straight. Right. I still got it. I can run straight. Right. But if I start bobbing and weaving, no. uh, then don't them, do them it. hamstrings gonna don't be do a little it. suspect. Don't do it. Let <laughs> me give you, let me give you a little bit of advice as a fifty six year old. It don't <laughs> creep up on you. One day you walking and everything's all right. And then bam, <laughs> everything just drops off. Listen, man, before I let you get on out of here, and first of all, thank you again for being on the show. SWAT, CBS, Paramount Plus, this Friday night, February 16th. Don't miss it. It's Valentine's Day right now, my brother. And this is Jamal Moore that I'm talking about here. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is, that's who we're talking to. We're talking to Jamal Moore. Any advice you want to give to the fellas out there on a Valentine's Day, any words of affection or, or, or adulation or whatever it is you want to give to the ladies on Valentine's Day. Floor is yours. Valentine, I'm in LA right now, so I woke up before before doing all this. I had to I had to take care of business, which is uh, take care of my girl. So, fellas, I took care of business. If you know what I'm saying, I took care of business. Right, but then on top right, of that, right. the, the icing on the icing on the cake right. is. Uh, Beautiful, beautiful arrangement of flowers, mm -hmm. and they got they they got these flowers out there um, that don't die. They're real flowers. They're real flowers. They're beautiful bouquet, and, and they last like a year. Really? So, I mean, fellas, you go get that man. She's smiling at you every day, every day. They don't die next week. They they they. they what the hell's the name of these flowers? What's on flowers? No, they, I'm telling you. I mean, I can show you. They right here. In the I'm room. just saying. What's but the I, name? I mean, I need to know what to go and ask for. Okay, them, out, out here, out out here in LA, it, the, the the store is called Venus de Fleur. Okay. Venus de Fleur. Venus de Fleur. Okay. No, I'm telling you, check it. And they got different shapes and all that stuff. Okay, okay. Now they ain't cheap. They ain't okay. cheap, right, man. Right. They 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 gonna buy you some peace in the house. They gonna hey. buy you. Some Pop peace said now. this to me many many years ago. You gonna pay. <laughs> Get over that. <laughs> yeah. You're gonna yeah. pay as a man yeah. that, that somehow, some way, you're gonna come out of pocket. Just get get used yeah. to it, get over it. Yeah. And then I got on and then I got her a little uh I got her a little uh a little Louis. Okay. A little Louis purse. Okay. And uh, she and she hasn't stopped, she hasn't stopped walking around the house looking at herself in the mirror. So, uh, excuse me. Uh, excuse me. So. She got a good man. That's what that's about. She got a good man. Shamar Moore. <laughs> Appreciate you, my man. Love you, man. It's good hey, seeing Stephen you. It's a, been a long Stephen time. A, nothing but not a hey, nothing but respect at all, at all. But hey, I want to see that calendar. Go in General Hospital, put on some baby oil. You know, you know. I got <laughs> let, no choice. Let the world know. Shamal, let the no, world know. Shamal, I got no choice. They trying to give me a love interest. I can't. Oh, I, I, can't I can't. I can't do that if I ain't together. I got to get it together, bro. I got to get it. I can't go out like that. I can't do that. Wait. You 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 gonna be in the sheets with a sock on, right? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can air that. <laughs> Get out of here, man. Love you, bro. Appreciate you, man. Take it easy, my man. The one and only Shamar Moore right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show. That man's a superstar, no doubt about the SWAT. This Friday. Coming up, Valentine's Day is here. The best Valentine's Day gifts. What are they? Usher! He's married, ladies. I know that's not news you want to see on Valentine's Day. And oh, by the way, a Jordan and a Pippin are no longer an item. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, you will in a minute. Stick around. It's the Stephen A. Smith Show. Back with more in a minute. Everyone knows I'm a sports fanatic, and I need to be in the middle of all the action. And how do I do that exactly? I use Prize Picks, the largest fantasy sports platform in all of the land with more than 3 million members. It's not only super exciting, but incredibly easy to play and takes only 60 seconds to make your picks. All you do is select two or more players from the NFL, the NBA, or even both, and then choose more or less on their in-game stats. So every catch, touchdown, or basket gets bigger every week. And there's no better way to turn the big game's energy into cash. So if you know everything about every player, like I do, and then pick correctly, you'll have a chance to win some big-time money. And get this, 
PrizePicks will match your first deposit of up to $100. That's right. Go to prizepicks.com and use code SAS for a first deposit match of up to $100. That's code SAS when you go to prizepicks.com. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show. As you can see, that beautiful background right there. That's why you got the digital screens. You can do stuff like that because it's about Valentine's. That's why you see all those hearts right there. You know why? Because everybody celebrates Valentine's Day. I mean, everybody celebrates Valentine's Day. Even the New York Post. They listed the four best Valentine's Day gifts and the three presents that will doom any relationship. This is Miss Rita Wiggle of the New York Post. This is what she said. Best and worst Valentine's Day gift. Let's go with the worst first, please. Lingerie, booze, bath salts. She got me there with the bath salts. I'm not going to argue with her about that. Here's what I think she's missing about the booze and the lingerie. Well, what if you take your woman out to dinner and she wants some booze? And then what if you get home and she wants to put on some lingerie. See, I don't think we're taking into account the desire of the receiver, the gift receiver at that particular moment in time. Now, I'm not talking about you bringing in a present and you buy a booze or you buy a lingerie, but keep in mind there are plenty of women on Valentine's Day who like both of these things. They might not want it as a present, but they like both, okay? By the way, let's go to the best right there, okay? Because we've got watches, eh, I'm not sure about that. That's not a great gift to me on Valentine's Day. Watch, what are you looking at? What are you talking about? We got time limited? What's going on? You know what I'm saying? I mean, what are we doing here? I don't know if that's a great gift. Chocolate, that works. That works. Like an aphrodisiac in some people's eyes, okay? All right? Assortment of fine chocolate candies, white, dark, and milk chocolate, sweets, all of that stuff. Yeah, you got to do that. Scarves. There are some scarves that are pretty fly, okay? Close up with hands knitting, a scarf. Obviously, it's like a spiritual cord between the giver and the recipient, so you never know how that could work out for you. You don't rule that out. Kitchenware. What the hell is this? Kitchen utensils? I mean, really? On Valentine's Day? That is a setup. Miss Wiggle, that is a setup. Because if a man brought a woman kitchen away, is that what you think of me? Is that what you think of me? I'm just gonna, I'm just, I'm just here to cook for you, to slave over a hot stove in a kitchen for you. Is that how you think of me? That's what she's gonna say. And you know it. So for you to throw that up there as one of the best gifts, Miss Wiggle, I respect, respectfully disagree with you. How dare you? That's what you think of me. Here I am. I'm thinking I loved you. I'm giving you, I'm giving you all that I have to give you, and this is how you treat me. That's all you think of me. That's what she's going to say. I know this. I was raised by five women. I keep telling y'all that. Anyway, now it's time for the tweets, okay? Let's get to some of these tweets before I get to the calls to close out the show, all right? The Stephen A. Smith Show. Let's get right to it, please. At FSU Alex underscore right Stephen A. Smith. What's your go-to move when you're trying to impress a girl? That's a very vague question. It depends on what stage you're at. You got to remember that, okay? What stage you're at. If it's at the very beginning, it's how you talk to them and how you look at them. If you've already gotten past the first date and you've gotten yourself a kiss and lucky enough to get that kind of affection, it's about holding her hand and how you hold her hand and how you touch her and where you touch her. I'm talking about in public because that level of recognition, the fact that you want everybody to know you're with this person, it might touch her very hard. And of course, one of the go-to moves is where you take them. Can't take them someplace cheap. Don't go out on a date to McDonald's. I taught you better than that. Next up, at Matt's Celtics writes, how do you know if you found the one? Are y'all ready for this? Are you ready for this? Listen up, everybody. For all of you whippersnappers out there that's having problems finding the right woman, 
Let me tell you something right now. You might think it's exciting times. You might think it's sex. You might think it's all of those different things. I'm not saying they don't have a contributing factor or don't play a contributing factor. But let me tell you the number one thing where you will know your woman is the woman for you. When you are bored out your damn mind. There ain't nothing to do. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing exciting on the horizon. All you're doing is laying around. She might be on the couch downstairs. You might be upstairs or vice versa. You might be in your man cave downstairs. She might be upstairs doing whatever the hell it is that she is doing. And it doesn't matter as long as she's there. When you don't care what you're doing, when you don't care what's going on, when you got options, it could be other women. It could be, you know, the boys. It could be parties. It could be anything. And you could care less. You don't mind sitting at home doing nothing as long as she's there with you. That's how you know. You could have great sex, and the minute you finish, you want them gone. You could go out to dinner and have a good time, the movies, etc. But that's a distraction from you and her. But when you are alone in each other's space, her voice doesn't annoy you. Your voice doesn't annoy her. You two enjoy being around each other. You don't give a damn what you're doing. As long as you're together, that's when you know. That's when you know. Next up. At Nolan Bianchi writes, what was Stephen A's first heartbreak? My first real heartbreak, I was dating a girl in high school. I broke up with her. She broke up with me, I'm sorry. Got in a little argument, we broke up with each other. And I was kind of depressed about it. And um, we were apart for a few weeks. I had met somebody else. She knew I was on the verge of talking to somebody else. And here she comes. And she takes me back. And she comes back and she coaxed me into taking her back, rather, and wanting to be with me, made sure she kissed me in public when the girl was behind me. I didn't know the girl was behind me, and she kissed me right in front of the girl, and I got caught. Even though I didn't date the girl yet, and I never kissed the girl yet or anything like that, but bottom line is she saw me kissing my ex-girlfriend at the time, who I rekindled things with. And I took her back. And when I took her back, she was with me for a few months, about two and a half months to be exact. I was working at a bookstore making $4.35 an hour. And I saved up $1,000 to take her to her prom. I took her to her prom. And she dumped me the next morning. Everything that she had done was to get me to take her to the prom, spending my money to do it, and then she dumped me the next day. Everyone who knows me says that that moment changed me forever because it made me so hardcore. No matter what woman is in my life, no matter how much I may love, no matter how much my heart is invested, et cetera, et cetera, I'm not breaking for anybody. I want you as much as you want me. You don't want me, I will find somebody else to want me. Everyone says that that is the day that I became that way. Before then, I was a teddy bear. Since then, I was something else. I don't know whether it's true or not. I just know that's the accurate story that I just gave you, and that's what people say the effect was that it had on me. Now it's time to get to the calls before I get on out of here. Stephen A. Smith Show right here over the digital airways of YouTube. Let's go to the lines right now. Let's go to Sanchez. You're live with Stephen A. What's going on, Sanchez? How are you? Sanchez, why are you breathing? Speak up. Going once, going twice. Bye-bye. Hudson, you're live with Stephen A. What's up, man? 
What up, Stephen? Talk to me. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How about yourself? I'm going all right. Happy Valentine's Day. Talk to me. All right. I want to know what your best riz is. How do you get your women? How do I get my women? Yeah. Well, first of all, I only have one. Oh, I'm sorry. Secondly, I'm sorry. Sec second, secondly and most importantly, um, look, I've been dating all my adult life, so uh, I, I clearly have had plenty. I'm not proud of it, but it's just the truth. Um, I would tell you, being raised by five women, I know to be decent. Um, you do not put your hands on a woman, ever. You do not do that. That's number one. Number two, you treat them how they want to be treated. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have an obligation to do the same to you. But what you don't have to do is get yourself caught up in, oh, my goodness, this is what I want from them, and I'm not doing anything for them unless I do. Guess what? When you go out to eat, don't you like to have company? good conversation. Don't you want to look at somebody beautiful while you're talking to them? There's nothing wrong with that. If you can afford it, there's nothing wrong with coming out of pocket and playing for dinner. There's nothing wrong with treating a woman to the movies. There's nothing wrong with great conversations and walks on the beach and all of this other stuff. You get to know people like that. There's absolutely positively nothing wrong with that. And my approach, I believe, has helped because any woman that is in my life is going to get taken care of. That's how I roll. It doesn't mean that I have to spend exorbitantly on them or anything like that. But what it does mean is that I'm going to treat you better than most. I know that. Plus, I happen to believe that I'm incredibly gifted. So because of the combination of those things, I don't really worry much about it. Just treat people right, and the rest will fall the way it's supposed to fall. Appreciate the call, buddy. Thank you so much, Hudson. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. All right. Nadio, you're live with Stephen A. What's up? How are you? Did I pronounce your name correctly? Hello? Hello? Nadia? Yeah, Nato. Yeah. Nato, yeah. Nato. Okay, go ahead. It's spelled N A D E A U. How you doing, How you doing Nato? What's going on? Good, how are you? I'm all right. Speak I to would... me. So, my question is about Jason Tatum not getting enough love in the league. Okay. I think that in the MVP race, it's all about Jokic, Shea, and when Embiid was healthy, Embiid. And now Luca, what else does Jason Tatum need to do on the number one team in the Eastern Conference, leading his team? Why is Jason Tatum not getting enough love? Well, he should get more love because Jason Tatum is a superstar in this league, and you're not going to get me to deny that. I just think that people's minds are on bigger things when it comes to him. Boston Celtics blew an opportunity to win the championship two years ago against Golden State. Last year, they were down 3-0, coming back from a 3-0 deficit to win three games before they lost in a game seven where Jason Tatum got hurt on the first offensive play of the game. I just think that their sights for him and his sights for himself are on something much, much bigger. And then you also look at the fact that they're jacking up about 43 three-point shots per game. Then you look at the rest of their team. Jalen Brown is a $300 million player. Chris Stapps Porzingis is no scrub, and he's seven feet three. And Derek White and Drew Holiday are one of the elite defensive backcourts in the game of basketball. So the parts that have been assembled around him, I think you have people looking at it from that perspective. But I do believe you're right. He does deserve more love than he has been receiving. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I appreciate that. Thank Do you, you think that Jason Tatum is better than Luka Doncic right now? No. I prefer Jason Tatum because of his all-around versatility and skills. But Luka Doncic as a big man is absolutely something spectacular, particularly with his IQ. Appreciate the call. Junior, you're Have live with one. Stephen A. Thank you. All right. Junior, in Mobile, in Mobile, in Mobile, you're live with Stephen A. What's up, Junior? How are you? Junior, are you there? Junior, you there? Hello? Junior, you're, you're, on the, you're on the air, bro. Stop talking to other people. Focus. Pay attention. What's up? You're live with Stephen A. What's up? What's up, Stephen A? I guess I had a question for you. Can I get about how, the, how about some Cowboys for Valentine's Day? Uh, who am I giving it for? Oh, just for all the Dallas Cowboy fans. The hell with you? Do you got your girl with you? If she want to hear that, it's Valentine's Day. What the hell are you calling me up yeah. asking me to say how about them Cowboys for you for? You want me to say it for your because girl? I'm, I don't have a girlfriend, Stephen oh, A. Oh, man, 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 goodbye, man. You got Valentine's Day. You calling up on Valentine's Day and you don't have a girl? What the hell's wrong with you? No, I'm I mean, sorry. you already disqualified yourself. Get the hell out of here. Goodbye. Sanchez, you're live with Stephen A. Are you there? Peterson, you're live with Stephen A. What's going on, Peterson? How are you?
Hi, I'm good, Stephen A. How are you? Talk to me. What's up? Happy Valentine's Day. All right. Day. Well, I know you put out on your Twitter that you were looking for relationship questions and stuff like that, but I'm sitting here with one of the biggest LeBron fans I know, and I need you to tell him that Jordan is the GOAT. I'm not telling them a damn thing. I've said it a thousand times, and Valentine's Day is not the day for that kind of nonsense. You need to go and get yourself some fun, all right? Get, the, get it together, bro. That's not what we're talking about today. Take care of yourself. I'll talk to you another time. We're right here. All right. Live Thank you, Stephen A. Goodbye. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. We're right here on the Stephen A. Smith Show over the digital airways of, ES, uh, of YouTube right here. Uh, before I go, I feel uh, obliged you know, to look out for my little brother right there. Um... Pippen and Jordan have broken up. Now, what am I talking about? It's been reported that Real Housewives of Miami star Larsa Pippen and Marcus Jordan, the son of Michael Jordan, have called it quits. Larsa Pippen is the ex-wife of Scottie Pippen, and Marcus Jordan is the son, as I just said, of Michael Jordan. There is a 16-year age difference. Now, clearly, Marcus Jordan is somebody that likes older women. Here's what I'm going to tell you. My brother, consider yourself lucky. Somebody's got to say it, so I'm going to say it. Consider yourself lucky. She is an older woman who happens to be the ex-wife of your father's teammate. Now, when she was his wife, you were a kid. So... I'm not going to cast any aspersions on her. Folks are adults. They're free to do what they want to do, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm quite sure I'm not alone in saying this. There's plenty of other people she could have elected to be with rather than the son of her ex-husband's former superstar teammate who happens to be considered universally as the greatest who have ever lived and there's nobody more popular than Michael Jordan. But if she did not care at least as much as she, one would say she should have, about how this would reflect on her ex-husband, who happens to be the father of her kids, then how much do you think she's thinking about breaking up with you whenever she felt like it? It's not to say y'all didn't have a good time, not to say that you didn't have a lot of love, not to say y'all might not make it back with one another. I don't know. But all I'm saying to you, my brother, is this. You got your whole life ahead of you. Heartbreak comes with it, even on Valentine's Day. But I assure you, you're Marcus Jordan. There are plenty of wonderful, lovely, beautiful ladies that would love to get to know you better. I think you'll be fine. I think you'll be fine. As for her, we know she'll be fine. She's one of the real housewives in Miami. Miami, she'll be just fine. Trust me. That's it for this edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show. I got to head to NBA All-Star Weekend. I'll be coming at you in a couple of days live from the city of Indianapolis. Looking forward to talking to y'all then. Until then, peace and love, everybody. This is Stephen A. signing off. Thank you for watching.